Okay, everyone, here we are. I am with Athena of Wild Willing Wisdom, and we are going to be talking about a very, very scary man. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so we're going to be talking about Martin Rothblatt today. We're going to be talking about the connection uh, between transhumanism and transgenderism um, and talking a little bit about what we've noticed uh, over the past year or so of our um, getting to know this guy and what he's about. Um, and I'm constantly learning new things about this man. I just learned something new uh, just about 10 minutes ago. So before we get into that, what attracted you to even do you know your own analysis of his book from transgender to transhuman? Yeah, what has been so interesting uh, for you about this topic? Well, for me, the way that my psyche kind of works is that I'm I'm constantly obsessed with like the latest unveiling of just how deep like the agendas of our present culture go. Because if there's anything that I've learned in the past 10 years is that what is happening is never what we're being told on like a surface level. Um, and when transgender ideology kind of started to become more mainstream and started popping up within all of the circles that I was frequenting, it didn't quite feel right to me. There was something about it that wasn't right, even though I was someone who frequented like the queer community and had relationships with women and, and was very familiar with that world, the transgender ideology kind of takeover of a lot of our spaces sort of felt off. And my intuition is usually not incorrect. <laughs> so when I caught wind of a transhumanism agenda that was related, I obviously couldn't look away. And I figured this must be where this new ideology is actually coming from. Because otherwise, why, why, you know? Um, and I discovered this book from Transgender to Transhumanism, which the title itself just like told me everything I needed to know about where to look next. And I found it online very easily. And so figured why not? I should know what, you know, they are, are saying about where they want this to go. Um, and once I started reading, I just couldn't look away. And, and it tie, it connected so many dots for me because I already sort of knew, like there's many layers to transhumanism, right? There's, there's the most popular of, of like the most common awareness of how transhumanism infiltrates our culture is kind of through the use of like phones and wearable technology and microchipping advancements and tracking things through like digital clouds and all of this kind of stuff and sort of like theorizing about where that's going to take us in the future. But the idea that we were going to transcend biology itself kind of put this on the map for me on like a whole other level. And I was also realizing that a lot of people didn't seem to have awareness that, the, that there was a connection there. Um, I think it's very easy for people to say, oh yeah, like I have this phone attached to my hand at all times. And the next step really is just to get like the screen, like, imp like implanted into my, my thumb. And, and then they go and watch their Hollywood, like AI robot kind of futuristic movies. And we can all sort of have a good laugh about where this is going, <laughs> but like to, again, like to just connect the dots between gender and biology and sex and transhumanism was sort of, the next level for me. And I saw the ways in which it particularly harmed women and children. And because the focus of my work and my purpose in life is to uplift women and their families, it became very intrinsic for me in regards to that, that journey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. So it sounds like it was infiltrating like your social circles and you see an indirect conflict with the, you know, um, liberation of women and girls and healing mothers and families and certainly holistic health. As, as you mentioned, the main purpose of transhumanism is to transcend nature, transcend biology. So, okay. That brings us to, yeah, Mar Martine, formerly Martin 
Rothblatt. Um, so essentially, you know, this guy is a, a billionaire. He started off um, with Sirius Radio and then marries a woman, has a daughter. The daughter has some kind of health issue and Martine swoops in and is there to save the day. And so his like hallmark story as told by him is that, you know, he came up with this wonderful cure for his daughter's illness through his, you know, ability to fund all of these uh, medical advancements or technological advancements. Mm -hmm. It's also very strange. So he's married to a black woman and I thought it was really weird that he would put like almost like a Sims like version of a black woman on the cover of the book. Mm -hmm. It's like very bizarre. And like, I think you know, I think he would certainly be classified as like autogynephilic. So like gets off to the idea of himself as a woman. And I feel like maybe in his, his ideal woman is a woman who looks like his, his wife, but he also then hasn't gone on to manipulate his body to look like a beautiful black woman. He's a white man who's had some, you know, facial feminization surgeries. Um, most of the images on the internet of him, he's wearing like a low ponytail. He's had breast implants, but like also still wears like pantsuits. So he's like, has a kind of like Armani pantsuit butch E <laughs> vibe. Uh, that's how I would like classify his look a little bit. Um, <laughs> like, not passable as a woman by any standards and certainly not as like a woman as beautiful as his, his wife. Um, so yeah, I just, right off the bat, I thought it was a really kind of strange pick, uh, choice for, for the cover. What do you, what do you think? What do you make of the cover? Well, when I first saw the cover, I also felt very confused and almost thought it was a joke. Um, I wasn't, sure, I wasn't sure if like I should take the book seriously or not. Like I had to like confirm that like this man actually wrote this, like, right. Like a, a person who has access to billions of dollars and then can't even pay a, a decent graphic designer <laughs> to design his book cover. But yeah, I, like, I thought it was a joke at first. Um, and then as I read it, I started unveiling like, okay, his wife is black and, um, he is probably some sort of homage to her in a way I, I, interview with him and her and they're quite obsessed with each other they have like a they have the pet name for themselves like marbina i think that they refer to them both as one um so they're they're very very much in love and and obsessed with one another and think that their souls will be in love forever and transcend their their the constraints of of human reality um so I do think that the cover art is an homage to her in, in some way. And then to speak to like the Sims-esque kind of illustration quality, I mean, there's an entire chapter in the book about cyberspace and cyber sex and what that is going to look like for us in the future. And the whole idea is that our life will be like the Sims where you can join these virtual realities and upload yourself into them as whatever it is that you want to be that day, however you're feeling. Um, he even kind of jokes, I guess, at, at one point about how like, you know, you don't have to be the, the shy, awkward guy in the corner. You can be like a sweet little girl. <laughs> and, and then if you, if you decide that it, you changed your mind, it doesn't matter because you can just log out and then come back the next day as another persona. Um, he also believes, uh, seems to believe that raising humans as a, a race is also a choice, which I found was very peculiar because I, I actually haven't heard of that kind of stance before, um, especially with critical race theory being very prominent in our culture right now that he sort of made a comment to insinuate that raising children to associate or identify with their lineage is also a choice and that we can choose to be race free just as much as we can choose to be sex free. So 
I, that's just a kind of a side note. I don't know if you think that directly has the, mm -hmm. the cover art, but like I do, I do find it interesting how here's this man who's kind of with a black woman and he's sort of obsessed with colonizing women's bodies. And he also thinks that like race is a choice to some extent, apparently. So I all think that's, that's sort of connected to the paradigm within which he lives, which is that our greatest human expression of creativity is going to be transcending all of these realities. It's so weird. And like, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you and like, it's, it's not the greatest gr design, but like the font is pretty like video game esque, you know, it gives off like those vibes, like, uh, yeah, that, okay. So I, I didn't realize they had a pet name for one another. He and his wife, Bina. Um, but it reminds me of there's this performance artist. I think he died a few years ago. His name is Genesis Briar Peoridge. Do, did you ever know who this guy was? Mm -hmm. So he was like a British um, contemporary artist uh, who would be classified now as like a trans woman, but he like kept his penis and he fell in love with this woman. And instead of having children, they decided to have a ton of plastic surgery to look like each other. Wow. So they like became one because they yeah got all this like fucked up surgery. And um, I'm pretty sure he died of a drug overdose, but I actually interned at a gallery in New York City that represented him. He was like the headliner of the um, of the gallery, like the featured artist. He was like the most famous artist that they represented. And um, I was interning at the gallery when he had an opening. So I met him and all the imagery is just basically like decapitated female body parts collage together. Like that's essentially what his work is. Like he's a collage, like mostly collage artist. And um, at the time I really glorified him and, and the art and uh, looking back, like <laughs> it's so fucked up, like on so many levels, like not only like just him, you know, like being like referred to as a woman, but like he was in such poor health and I'm sure it was related to like all the, you know, medications and stuff and maybe like drug abuse as well. But, um, but yeah, his whole, his, his fascination w was like chopping up the body and like repurposing, which again is like so commonly romanticized as you know, in like fashion and art and, um, yeah, there are just a lot of parallels to this whole, you know, Martine and, and Bina situation, although it seems like as far as Martine goes, you know, it's it's it doesn't seem like he's trying to really be as explicitly like transracial. Um, right. But yeah, it's it's like uh, it's interesting how. I mean, we, we truly know nothing about their like private relationship, but like on the surface, it looks like a point of like deep intimacy for them to like be in the, that paradigm, um, this like transcendent shit, um, which we know is quite dark. Yeah, it's almost like a little bit of like a technological spin on spiritual oneness. Because it's like on, on one hand, I sort of agree with him on, in some ways that like, I, I do believe that we are all consciousness and that our, our spirit is kind of like part of a, a greater creation that we are all kind of like equally connected to. And that the lives that we live in at in, in the, the now moment is kind of what we have chosen for this particular period of time, but it doesn't really define like who we are. And like, I can, I can see some like parallels in how he speaks about like romanticizing this, that like, you know, we're not our race and we are not our, our sex. And, but, but then he takes it to this level where it's like, we can't just accept that and then have this life experience and then 
have faith that when we die, we think we know where we're going to go next. It's like, no, we need to transcend it now, immediately, to the point where we are mutilating our bodies to cheat the life that we are living in, and then upload our consciousness to computers so that we can confirm through AI that we will continue to live on. It, it's sort of this like weird perversion of, of just other than just accepting like, when I die, my spirit will return to the conscious realm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, no, yeah. I want to plug my brain into right. a computer mind map and like ensure that I will continue living in that format. Yeah. That's like, he's used the language of spirituality and even religion to justify or sell colonizing the female and human body. I mean, do you believe that he actually believes that this is like the path to salvation? Like, you see one of these just like evil, like this, like, you know, like how people talk about Elon Musk, like he just, you know, just this curious inventor just got all got access to all these like evil tools, you know, like it's like this <laughs> curious little boy gone wrong, you know, who's like becomes this like evil Frankenstein. Do you think? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, you know, I've, I've kind of been I have been thinking about it in that way. And, and I've, I've sort of been dismantling for myself this like to, to such an extent that it's affecting how I even think of these characters about like what is good and, and bad. And I almost uh, I'm like on the verge of of believing that people like Elon Musk or Bill Gates or Tim Rothblatt like aren't actually evil in that within their paradigm, they think they are doing the right thing. Like the way that Martin talks about his philosophy throughout his book is very optimistic and very playful and like almost loving. Like I, I, I do think that he thinks that this is a good thing and that this is an incredible thing and a creative thing and that it's going to lead to the liberation of humanity. Mm -hmm. And so from our standpoint as being more like, I suppose, naturalists, if you will, like it's very easy to see this character on the other side of the playing field and say like, oh my God, this person is evil because it's like, look how like they're maniacal, right? But I, I don't know, I, I, I kind of wonder if it's more so about like how his life path is just manifesting. I mean, like there are a couple um, quotations from the book that I included in my analysis um, in the previous video that I made about that kind of like signaled to me that this individual has some serious trauma around what it means for him to be, as he put it, trapped in a male body. Um, and there was another something else that he said as well, in which he kind of compared what it was like for a woman to be mannish versus a man to be womanish. And the way in which he described those two scenarios, I mean, you couldn't even compare. Like he, he, it was as if he thought men who were tried, who, men who were feminine, I think he said were like, received the scorn of like slave masters. Like he, he used some incredible, like incredible metaphor. And then, but then to describe the woman's experience becoming or expressing mannish qualities, he barely gave any words to that. So like, like to me, I just kept seeing through this text into a person who like, obviously something is, is going on here. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, obviously yeah. there is a psychology to why this is a stance that he's taken, why he's chosen to manipulate his body um, and why he feels that sex is a lifelong trap that like, like to such a degree that he wants to elevate us into a world in which we just live cyber lives that we can be whatever we want. Like to me, that yeah. is self-hatred and that's, yeah. that's just yeah. the way that I view it. And there's very similar parallels though with the trans ideology. Like some, a lot of people say like, Oh, I just believe in love. I just believe in love and I want people to be happy and like live how they feel. And, it, and it's like, well, 
is, is it love to allow your 15 year old daughter to chop off her breast? Is that, is that what love looks like? That's what love looks like now that like we accept it's like self-hatred to such a degree that we'll like take drugs that will give us like cancer and osteoporosis like 15 years later. Like that doesn't equate to me. Right. Right. Like they already have marriage rights, like pretty much like in all States in the U S gay marriage has been legalized. Like they're not asking for like the same things that any other, other person has, like the demands are like, pretend that I'm something that I'm not or suffer the consequences. You know, it's not like we demand like equal pay or, you know, uh, the right to marry or, you know, it's like, no, we, we demand to change our legal documents and have insurance companies cover surgeries to cut off healthy body parts. Yeah. And as you said, you know, create long lifelong dependence on pharmaceuticals. Like we demand lifelong dependence on pharmaceuticals. Like that's like what the demands are. It's and that's important. That's important to note too, because like, again, like consider the paradigm within this, with, within which this person lives, like he's the founder of United mm-hmm. Therapeutics. And like, it's not even that, oh, he owns a pharmaceutical company that sells baby aspirin or something like that. And it's just like a profit deal. It's like, no, like this, com- this is a biotechnology company that is experimenting with genetic modification and like pig cloning. Like that, that is, that is what it takes in this person's mind to cultivate health and life extension. Yeah. And it obviously does not address any of the root causes. I mean, I can't even imagine how many billions of dollars are being funneled into these experiments. And yet there are millions of people all over the world who don't have access to clean water and food. I mean, it should just be like, it should just be obvious that this is not really about health and well-being. Yeah. So I've like been thinking about like what Martine's like Enneagram is and like what his like astrological sign is because he's like such a freaky guy. Um, and I want to say he might be a four because like fours can be super like on the Enneagram scale because like fours are self-involved. And I and I and I say that because um, just 10 minutes before we started recording, I realized that his the drug for like um, pulmonary hypertension that he created is called um orintram and that's martin Rowe spelled backwards it's like something that like a sixth grader would do or like a, a total full-blown sociopath i don't know i'm like now i'm like i'm now i'm like trying to find all the ways and like to prove my point of like why this guy is so scary not that we need not, not that we need to um but like I think about his like part of his origin story or sorry, part of his, you know, like Hallmark story is like, you know, saving his daughter's life. And it's like, you could draw a parallel between those who use third party reproductive technology to get pregnant, to create life. Like there's a story that without science, like they wouldn't have all the things that they, that they love in this world, you know, like it's, you know, if you take a, a couple who's used third party reproductive technology to like start their family, it's like they're going to have like a lot more. They're going to hold a lot more tightly, um, a lot more tightly to the idea like that science is the answer and that medical technology is like, you know, they're indebted, you know, forever. So I, I wonder if in his case that's truly how it happened. Or if there was like, uh, that, that belief was already there before, you know, this, this, you know, kind of take off of the United therapeutics. I'm like wondering what came first, chicken or the egg? Like, Mm. yeah. And I also want to say like, I I think it's important to classify him as like autogynephilic versus just like a homosexual man. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, like again, I'm using Ray Blanchard's, you know, kind of chart of, of how to delineate. And I, and I say that because Martine like came out as a quote unquote woman when he was middle-aged. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I just feel like that's important to say. And that like when Googling this guy, it's mind blowing how much propaganda there is from Ted talk and NPR and New York times, like all referring to this 
man as a woman, like exclusively using she, her to describe him. It's mind blowing. I mean, I've had a distrust in like Ted and what they do for like a while now, but this just like keeps sealing that. And if anyone hasn't already seen his talk on Ted, it's fucking chilling. And I think actually the most chilling part about it is the nonchalant demeanor of the the person interviewing him. It's like, tell me more about the robot. Wow. You know, and it's like, they're just like two men t- having a conversation. <laughs> it's like, it's like the <laughs> totally. level of delusion that that interviewer like has to take on. I is like astounding to me. And of course, I, who knows if it's like genuine or not, the, the guy could be like interviewing him could be to like totally, um, you know, an actor or whatever, but yeah. yeah, I wanted to speak a little bit to his like, um, like you're calling it his Hallmark story, because I've seen it used in in two different ways. And it almost does seem to be working in his favor in regards to garnering some sympathy or empathy for his views and his situations. Um, because I, I noticed the most stark difference was reading his epilogue and how he described his transition and people's response to his transition, particularly in the world of business, in which he kind of used it as a tool to confirm that all of the ideas that he shared in the book were like that the world was ready for it. Because when he transitioned um, and to continue going into, you know, global business ventures that nobody seemed to care and that all that mattered was everyone's bottom dollar. He even quoted one business partner as saying something close to, I don't, I don't care what you are as long as you keep making me lots of money. So he kind of used these examples as a way to support the idea that the world was ready for this. And that we, and of course, because of transgender ideology, that we were just one, you know, skip away from embracing the transhumanism component. Uh, But then when you read about his transition and the world's reaction to that in through the mainstream media, there was one report in particular, I think from CNBC, I I always get them all confused. (laughs) They don't really follow them, but um, they painted this completely opposite picture of his transition as being so hard and how he, all these big, partners because they just didn't accept him for who he was now as a woman um, and how difficult that was, but how it doesn't, you know, it doesn't put a chip on his shoulder and um, him and Bina are, are, are confident that the world will be able to embrace this form of love and acceptance and that they're just going to keep doing um, what they, what they do best. And so it became obviously confusing because it's like, well, which is it? Like, did, did the world shun you or did the world embrace you because all they care about is money? And even the, the experience he had in saving his daughter's life has been used to kind of paint him as a person who has overcome hardship. And I'm sorry, a- anybody, anybody with access to the amount of resources and influence, especially as a man, as this person has, is not oppressed. <laughs> like, I don't know, I, I cannot find any way to view this individual as an oppressed person who has overcome a lot of hardship. Like it's just not on the table for me. Exactly that. But that's what we're continuously asked to do every single time trans ideology like comes up. It's like, where is your, like the, you know, the liberal minded, you know, quote unquote liberal minded person is constantly looking for your empathy for these men. And if it's not there, if they can even sniff that, like you have any doubt, like not, 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 not just to mention, like, just, you know, not even acknowledging that they're biological men, which is the only kind of man there is. Sorry. There's no, there's no difference between a biological man and a man there. It's just a man, you know, certainly that, that, that would be considered offensive to name his, him as a man, but to, yeah, to show any like lack of empathy for this, (laughs) billionaire white man is like bigotry. It's totally insane. So yeah, I think, yeah, his, his Hallmark story is, is totally what we see repeated over and over and over um, within these like pro trans 
spaces um, constantly dismissing actual oppression of women and centering the needs of men who like may or may not be victims of homophobia, you know, like. Right. And his book has a lot of that in it too, in, in which he kind of, he was obviously aware that he needed to um, kind of explain how this applies to women's rights and feminism. Um, but I found that he, he sort of like took all of those issues and twisted them around into non-issues and non-concerns and non-complaints. Uh, and even tried to argue that, I think he calls it, called it neo-feminism, um, that neo-feminism uh, actually would support this because certain, a certain wave of feminism um, at the time that he wrote the book was advocating for essentially women to be treated as equals in a man's world. And he, he sort of kind of spun this as like to show that because we are equals, um, this philosophy doesn't have any actual negative impact on women. And he discussed the prison issue and the sports issue and the bathroom rape issue uh, and very quickly sort of dismissed all of those concerns with very simple and easy answers, um, half of which were absolutely hilarious, in my opinion, and also totally inappropriate in a way coming from a man who clearly doesn't know what it's like to have any of those concerns. Wow. It's so fucked up. And like, he has a daughter, like he has a daughter who knows she's a woman. He has a wife who knows she's a woman that I think ideology, his ideology can only flourish in the bubble that he's created for probably not only himself, but her is for his family. You know, like the fact that he could, I mean, we don't know what his daughter actually thinks, but like, yeah, the only scenario where I can see women going along with this shit is, you know, having never been cognizant of their own oppression, which is the case for many, many women who are, you know, deeply affected by misogyny and sometimes homophobia and more obvious acts of, you know, physical assault, violence, rape. I always kind of frame it in my mind as, as, this idea that women have no problem accepting that men can be women if they themselves are not secure in understanding what womanhood is. And because then any, anybody can claim it. Mm -hmm. And I think that women in our culture are extremely disconnected um, from their womanhood and from oppression that they experience for being a woman, just even in not like dramatic terms, but even in just in like the subtle ways that we're raised uh, around advertising and media messaging and generational trauma with our matrilineal lines uh, and being communicated through, through that and through other women in their, in their society, like immediate communities about how to behave and how to be kind and how to be, subtle and how to let other people have what they want and just like catering to men and um and then also being disconnected right like we're we're disconnected from our our menarche and our menstruation we're disconnected from our bodies and birth we are disconnected from the rite of passage that is menopause i mean like through every stage of life woman is completely disembodied mm -hmm. from the very biological experiences that make us women. And yeah. if we are disconnected from that, it's going to be very easy to then convince us that anyone can claim that title and call themselves a woman, including yeah. men who don't yeah. have any capacity to have any of those experiences. For sure. For sure. And it's framed as control. It's framed as freedom and liberation, just like, you know, the way birth control, hormonal birth control has been framed in that way. Um, so has, you know, testosterone injections for 12 year olds. It's, yeah. it's really, it's such a lie. Yeah. It's such a lie. Um, 
Oh, maybe let, let's talk, maybe talk about the parts of his book or, you know, his ideology that, that we actually like agree with, because I think that's the, that's the, um, I know you got into that in your analysis, you know, your, your thorough analysis of the book, but, um, like this is a, this is a touchy subject, you know, for gender critical rad femme women, um, because, well, what trans ideology has done is it's used the language of feminism to sell its shtick. So that's often why they get conflated, you know, like why, why conservatives and people on the like far right will conflate the two, will conflate feminism and um, trans ideology and, and, and blame feminists for <laughs> trans ideology, which is so fucked up. Um but like on the surface, and I think one of the reasons why it's so alluring to so many people is because it has the promise of freedom and liberation. But what we know about trans ideology is and, and, and transhumanism is it's a it's a lie, like it's actually not freedom. It's actually complete dependence on these systems, um, especially, you know, pharma, pharmaceutical and, you know, obviously medical industrial complex. So but at its like, you know with its like highest intention, let's give it that, let's give it some credit. And let's say it has like a positive intention, right. It would be to dismantle stereotypes, right. Or let's say the, the most like high intentioned non-sociopathic person who's attracted to a trans ideology, like wants freedom. They want to be able to, you know, be themselves without persecution, without harassment. And that's not to be mistaken for pretending to be someone else or something else that they're not. But, you know, so. Yeah, I guess what are what were the parts of the book and what are the parts of what he says that that you agree with, if any? Yeah, well, he does mention uh, at one point that he thinks that we go about labeling um, our children backwards in that. uh you know, they're born and then they're given a gender label before they get a chance to actually grow into what their expression of their gender is. And so I, I suppose in a way he's saying that like, we should be raised genderless um, until the child can decide for themselves how they want to be in the world. But like the reason, like, I agree with him in that we should be able to express ourselves however we wish. Meaning if a little boy wants to wear pink sparkly dresses, it should not be considered a problem that needs a solution. Or if a girl wants to don, you know, blue jean overalls and play with trucks, that shouldn't be an issue that we feel we need to find a solution for. But, but the, where he, where we break off is where, um, well, first of all, he, he conflates the two, he, co he confuses the word sex and the word gender throughout the entire book. And it's extremely confusing. And I, I, want, I don't want to believe that it was done on purpose, <laughs> but I do think confusion kind of like adds to the, the, the gullibility of the reader. Yeah. Because by the end, you kind of like don't really know what you're talking about anymore. Like in, in the beginning, he sort of at one point, he sort of says that gender is an ex our, is our expression of our sex. Um, and I, I guess I sort of agree with that, although I kind of don't think gender is really a thing at all. Um, but then but then he says, like, sex is like also sort of an expression of our gender identity. Like it, it just they, like they he, he's, he's mm. so thoroughly confused what the two words mean. And then throughout the entire book, he uses them interchangeably. And so it kind of doesn't really support the idea that this individual really has working definitions for these two words as separate words. He sort of seems to think that sex and gender are both creative expressions of a human's identity that can be, that it can look like a boy wearing a pink dress, but it can also look like a boy chopping off of his, chopping off his penis and saying that he's a girl. Um, so he gets close in certain points where he kind of acknowledges that like gender stereotypes are harmful. And I agreed with him 
on those points because I do think gender stereotypes are harmful. Uh, but but again, like his his solutions for that problem, he's kind of like clinging to this idea that women are feminine and men are masculine and that we should be able to like interchange those two experiences by way of changing our our sex identity not mm-hmm. just our our gender identity whatever that even means mm-hmm. and to clarify you don't agree with that i don't agree that we should embrace this idea that we can change our sex in order to fit into like gender stereotypes yeah i yeah. think that i think that we should be able to acknowledge that our children come into the world as either male or female, but also embrace that they can express that as however they wish moving forward in life without having to then pigeonhole them and say, oh, well, it must mean that you're actually a boy. And so we are going to do something about that by mutilating your body. Yeah. That's where it doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. Whenever he's yeah, whenever someone is suggesting that sex is not immutable, which he 100 percent is like if if he's yeah, he says if he's saying that sex is an expression that like right away is a massive red flag. And like I think I think that, in you know, using gender and sex interchangeably is absolutely intentional. It's a confusion technique like it's mm-hmm. absolutely. And it was um, uh, when I spoke to Rhea Riley, like almost a year ago, she's the one who like brought this to my attention. And I'm, I'm a hypnotist. Like I know how to write and, and conduct like confusion, you know, sessions and inductions to like reprogram, you know, positive thoughts and habits and behaviors. And when she said that to me, I was like, Oh, right. Like, duh, duh. Like it's absolutely, I have no doubt that it's intentional. Like it, it, it's become so convoluted also, you know, and it's like, it goes beyond just like postmodern theory. Like it's his theory has, um, material real world consequences. It's not just like art criticism, you know, like this doesn't exist in a vacuum. No. And like, I also find that there was a lot of perversion to how he did propose categorizing sexual identity he he includes a chart in the book that of course uses a rainbow of colors (laughs) and is sort of like um he calls it the chromatic chromatic sexual identity and that instead of being male or female or boy or girl that we're going to align with um, a spectrum of color and his, his the identity that he subscribes to these colors he calls self reported mental nature And all of the descriptions have something to do with the person's sense of like um, sexual sexuality, not in terms of sex identity, but in terms of like their eroticism. And there was something very oddly perverted about it. It wasn't even that he's saying like, oh, a person who identifies with the color green is going to be a biological female who feels masculine (laughs) or like I don't know like something like that it literally like okay so like one example is um the color orange he associates with a non-nurturing person self-described as equally aggressive and erotic and then a person who associates with the white color is a person who feels genderless lacking aggressiveness nurturance or sexiness Like all of these descriptions have something to do with how the person identifies with their literal sexuality. And I found that to be quite perverted and odd. He also gets into sexuality a little bit in terms of like the erasure of sexuality, like how, you know, being uh, gay or queer or lesbian, like none of those words are going to matter. And I know you've talked about this on your channel before as well, about how like people are just going to have sex with people. Right. And that- yeah, those labels aren't going to matter anymore, just as mm-hmm. the labels of male and female aren't, aren't going to matter anymore. Yeah. And then he has a he has a part where he talks about the world of pleasure within like avatar cyber sex, like that there's like a whole nother like 
world that we haven't tapped into that's going to like be super, super orgasmic. And it like reminds me of the Black Mirror episode. It's all Black Mirror. It's all, <laughs> so- I mean, it's all Black Mirror, <laughs> duh, duh. But like specifically, you know, which episode I'm talking about where the two guys get addicted to the video game and like one plays a woman and one plays a man and they have like, they have like addictive, like they have addictive sex. So they're like both heterosexual men who like have their respective like lives who like are exploring this new video game and then yeah have this cyber sexual experience that yeah they they fall in love with each other's avatars and are like become addicted to each other's like chemistry within this video game which is insane to even use the word chemistry when we're talking about avatars because Mm-hmm. there's there are no chemical like there what ca- there are no chemicals <laughs> right I, he he describes it at, at one point as how it's going to be made possible through advancements in wearable technology because um for example like if if this is my suit or my my cyber my cyber reality when i put it on and then and log in to the cyber reality if someone within the cyber reality puts a, a hand on my shoulder and squeezes it, the suit will actually compress and develop a warm sensation so that you can mimic the experience of being um, connected to somebody. It, it, com- it completely uh, uh, erases or eliminates the need to have in-person interaction. And in, in regards to like the whole chemical, like, right, like chemical experience because like all emotions and love and everything it's all just chemicals right like it's all we're all just like a complex matrix but um again like this the paradigm within this person lives like that matrix is really not relevant like he he really brushes off in many different using many different verbiages that like oh or hormones are nothing really to be to be concerned about or to use as a point of argument because we can just manipulate it or alter it with pharmaceutical drugs. Like he says this, this is his solution. Like I I wouldn't be surprised if the wearable technology at some point would also come with a tiny injectable needle that can just prick you whenever somebody interacts with you in a certain way to inject you with the whatever hormones needed to mimic the experience of like being in person with that that oh individual God. like like all of this can be yeah. manipulated by the advancement of technology wearable tech pharmaceutical drug use yeah the whole thing yeah like you're like you get a slow drip of like antidepressants or something <laughs> like right oh my god i mean and yeah, yeah uh, well you know like speaking of replicating human contact and like being in isolation like what do you think he makes of, uh, what did you call it I, on your stories the other day, the medication du jour? What do you think he makes of like the, the medication du jour situation that we're, we're in uh, right now? Well, it depends on how you perceive the events that are unfolding. If you are viewing it from the standpoint that there really is no danger and there is no need for the injection du jour. And therefore that means there's no need for a passport, right? To track whether or not we have been receiving these injections, but they're actually, that's, that's where the, the juice is because like there is a need, there is not a need for the fear and the isolation and the injections, but there is a need for the passport because the passport is what is going to get us to the next level of our transhuman existence in which we have a global population who's constantly plugged in and monitored to the digital system, which ultimately furthers this agenda that he's describing in terms of erasing biological reality being plugged into these computer screens where you and I never have to meet in person because there's no need. Because if I want a warm hug from you, all I have to do is log in and put on my wearable suit and touch you in digital space and I can receive a compression hug 
from the fabric on my body. No. <laughs> we say I mean, no. Like, <laughs> so if if you're if you view if you have the capacity to view the events that are unfolding as not having anything to do with public health but having everything to do with advancing the digital agenda I am quite certain that this individual would be highly in favor of the events. He even mentions at some point in the book about how um, what we are doing with video conferencing, he sees as a step forward. Yeah. That even the fact that like in Zoom calls, we can like change the background that we're, that we're sitting in front of, like yeah. that to him is a step forward in getting people accustomed to living within this cyber reality. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and again, like, you know, obviously we, we've talked about this, like uh, the, like the fear of what's next, but like also just sitting with the reality that we're, we're already there, you know, whether we're talking about third-party reproduction, right. Surrogacy, um, even prostitution, like we could, we could make an argument that, you know, that is totally transhumanist in its in its commodification of, you know, the body and the inside of, of women's bodies. And, um, I mean, he, he outright says in the book that gestation and, um, what do you say? Con conception even in regards to sperm donors that like it is currently commodified mm -hmm. and it will continue to be so yeah. Like the, the whole, that whole like artificial birth industry is part, very clearly part of this agenda because like ultimately we are all commodities, whether, whether you're viewing, um, whether you're viewing the current state of affairs through like a transhumanist perspective or just through like digital control uh, and social credit scores and things of that nature, or like even as an equity, um, what is not equity banker, but like you know, a, a globalist billionaire banking system, human bodies exist to be colonized and have resources extracted from them, whether it's data, uh, reproductive value, sex, entertainment, um, pharmaceutical profit, like we, we just exist to serve those, um, those, those agendas, those money making yeah. schemes. Yeah. Yeah. Oof. I've noticed in a couple write-ups about him, he's quoted using the metaphor of, you know, like baking something in an oven, you know, which is used to describe like, you know, just gest gestation. Um, yeah, that was just something that I noticed. Like he's He's quite obsessed, like he's an inventor, he's a creator. Um, and we know, you and I know that women are the ultimate creators of, of life, right? Without life, there, there's nothing, right? So um, I can't help but see his, his clawing at something that is, is really unattainable like he will never create life he might be able to facilitate artificial cloning but it will never be the same i mean this is where the kind of perversion of consciousness comes into play because it's like on one hand it sounds like he's in alignment that consciousness transcends our our human realities on the other hand he almost doesn't really believe that that there is a natural law to true consciousness because yeah like so what you can take take a baby and bake it in the oven without any human connection with sperm from california and an egg and like whatever right <laughs> um but like but there's no like regard there for what the like like psycho spiritual imprints are going to be on that life's experience because like that is very real um, and then even in, and then even stretching it into AI and how he believes that he believes that not only can we upload our consciousness into a computer, but that there will be ways to judge whether or not a computer is so conscious that we should actually give it legal rights 
and treated as other human beings in society. Right. And that's what he wants to do, I think, with his wife or with the, like yes. the robot that he's created. He wants to preserve his wife's like consciousness in digital form, which is, right. again, another episode of Black Mirror slash our lives now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Black Mirror, a.k.a. Yeah. 2021. Um, yeah. And he also he also specifically says multiple times that like society's acceptance of the idea that men can become women and women can become men are a convenient and, and um, necessary stepping stone to get society to then also agree with the idea that computers can maintain consciousness and be treated as legal entities within society. Oh. To the point too, where he's also even talking about how we will reproduce as digital conscious entities. Yeah, um, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. And he also, I think it's also important to mention um, how he, so he, in my opinion, kind of lamely at attempts to support these ideas through the use of like science, um, which is such a, a talking point. I mean, does the word science even mean anything anymore? <laughs> the way that we're all throwing it around and trying to use it to support um, our 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 perspectives on on the world but he he does try to advocate for trans ideology using science by citing very strange experiments to be honest with you i mean at one point he mentions studies that were done at john johns hopkins in like the 1990s with in which like embryos or like zygotes were fertilized in test tubes and then the embryos grew in like fatty cavities near the intestines of like gorillas and then they were like c-sectioned out and were deemed healthy and it was like they, he was like using these experiments as a as a way to prove that like healthy <laughs> i'll put it in quotes like it help, the, the birth of healthy infants doesn't need to happen through like um, a, a womb essentially that it can happen in like if you can implant a zygote into any biological thing that walks and, and we'll just grow it in there and then we'll like pull it out. Like it's, it's like so sci-fi and like, and so bizarre. And like, so like these experiments were kind of used to support the whole like in vitro fertilization thing and like gestation is just a commodity and like anybody can do it, anybody can have it. Um, and then of course he also referred to the situations in which like animals in the wild are hermaphrodites or they change their sex depending on like the 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 population that they're living within to balance it and it, like and it was just so incredible to read these examples being used seriously because there is a massive difference between being a creature that is evolved to gestate or reproduce in the ways that nature has manifested for that creature versus like a human being who has not evolved to be able to do any of that and has to mimic that experience with so much force that we literally mutilate our bodies in a way that is overall detrimental to our ability to thrive. Like there's just obviously such a difference between those examples. And um, it was just amazing to me that the whole like sliver limpet example was like being presented to me as, as something that, that should be considered reasonable. I, I could, it was very, it was, it was astonishing. It was astonishing for me. And I was, I really did try to read the book from a very neutral standpoint and to embrace um, his, his talking points and his arguments and, and see if there was something that I was missing. Um, and I was, I was highly unimpressed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. His other, his other main talking point is like with the fall of, you know, racial apartheid in South Africa, like, sex is the next frontier like again always you know trying to i mean this is what trans ideology does it it, it tries to constantly find a home in in movements that have actually been based on liberation like using the language of feminism using the language of apartheid in south africa like and again like it you know obviously his worst fear is like his mortality, which is why he's so obsessed with, you know, this like artificial preservation and constant creation. 
Um, and I think, yeah, your your like uh, your theory of of him, you know, suffering from like a like this this being like a trauma response, I think is is probably super accurate and and that there's yeah no no obviously no respect for life um but even less respect for you know the intelligence of of death Mm -hmm. yeah so well i feel like we covered a lot. And again, I just want to repeat that uh, Athena has done like a super thorough analysis of the book. So if you want to not buy the book, (laughs) not, uh, you know, give him money, then you can head over to Athena's YouTube channel and watch her uh, very thorough analysis of of the book and and learn even more about kind of what this guy stands for so that you have clarity over what transhumanism is is really all about and like you you said with the title of the book like there's no hiding it he doesn't see transhumanist like as an insult at all like it's it's his greatest achievement we you know I think equate transhumanism to, you know, destruction and entirely like nature and certainly like uh, erosion of women's sex based rights and all of that. But yeah, in his world, his, his, uh, his tra- transhumanism is like, it's, yeah, it's his greatest uh, achievement. And so that's how he's referred to um, all over the internet and obviously no shame in in any of it, because that's what he called the book. Um, it's also really wild to remember that the book was written exactly 10 years ago. Right. And so I couldn't help but like be, be conscious of that while I was moving through the material and just seeing like it, as if a woman is um, or anyone really is particularly new to what's happening with trans ideology, or maybe they have children who are like coming home, like sharing these, these ideas, and they, they're kind of caught off guard about like where this is coming from. It was really comforting in a, in a strange way for me to read the book, knowing that it was written 10 years ago, knowing that this is a class of citizens who are funding this ideology, and gaining clarity on exactly what the messaging is exactly what the what the language is, and knowing, understanding what direction uh, all of that is coming from and how it is purposely uh, infiltrating not only educational spaces, but even uh, I think he called it uh, entertainment uh, content. That That's one of his like top three ways that he thinks that we are going to bring down the apartheid of sex. And the third point is specifically to uh, promote this ideology within educational and entertainment spaces. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, where can people find you, Athena, um, and learn more about your work? Yeah, my website is wildwillingwisdom.com. I did just recently start a YouTube channel. I'm also on Odyssey, uh, Wild Willing Wisdom in both places. And of course, to be totally up to date with all my latest shocking discoveries, <laughs> you can find me on Instagram as well at Wild Willing Wisdom, where I mostly talk about women's liberation in regards to birth, health, and certainty. Amazing. Thank you so much, Athena. This was a, yeah, I'm really glad we, we got into this today. So thanks for taking the time to come on.